So, here's my simplest explanation of the book of Revelation, especially the first four horses of the apocalypse. The question is, why these four? Why these colors? I'm going to submit to you that there is information contained in the colors. God is not trying to confuse us. And he's not just throwing colors out there, is he? No. There must be a rational uh, justification for why he picked these four. Don't you think? Okay. So take a look at your screen and just follow with me. What do you see? Here's the symbol, the national symbol of next door neighbor to Israel, Jordan. What colors do you see? Can you help me here? White, red, black, and green. Okay. And then if you go next door, inside the territory of Israel, there is the Palestinian, symbolized by that flag. Well, guess what? They look the same, don't they? So when people say the Palestinians need a homeland, guess what? They got it. It's called Jordan. When they divided Palestine, which used to be much, much bigger, 70-odd percent of Palestine went to Jordan. It was called Transjordan in the beginning, and then Jordan was the part for Palestinians to live. So if you're looking for a homeland for the Palestinians, Jordan should be opening up the floodgates and say, welcome, we welcome the immigrants. Why don't they? But flags tell you something. Colors tell you something. Let's go on. Uh, what colors do you see on the national flag of Sudan? This is another player in World War III, according to Ezekiel 38-39. Help me out here. Do you see white, red, black, and green? Okay, let's go to Kuwait. What do you see? White, red, great. Let's go to the United Arab Emirates. What colors do you see? Help me out. Let's make a chorus together. White, red, black, and green. All right, well, let's just go to Libya because it could just be coincidence here. What colors do you see? Okay, let's go to Afghanistan. What do you see? Let's go to Syria. What do you see? Let's go to Iraq. What do you see? I wonder if God has successfully communicated something through simple colors. Why is it so complicated? Why do prophecy teachers have to make it so hard? Because they watch the news first. In the days when Gorbachev was around and he was the enemy of Ronald Reagan, then it was Russia. Russia's the Antichrist. Russia's the white horse. And now China's coming up economically. Now it's China. China's going to invade Israel. I don't know if China's going to invade Israel. I don't know. But what I know is God said look for white, red, black, and green. Right? And if you look at it, what is ISIS trying to do? It's trying to combine Syria and Iraq. Let me flip that. Syria and Iraq. Syria and Iraq. Why are their flags so similar? Because historically they were the same empire. They were the same country. So ISIS is not as crazy as you think. There is a historical root to what is going on, what is being played out right now. Now you compare that to the flags of other nations. If you look at the flag of New Zealand, it's almost a copy of the flag of Australia. Because there's a intimate relationship. There's a connection between our two countries. You just take one star away and you color in the white stars red and you get the Kiwi flag. Then you look at the Aussie flag at the top left corner. It has a Union Jack, which is a copy of the English flag. Why is that? Because a lot of us came originally from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, including my, half of my ancestors, came from there. And so you can see the relationship and the history and the legacy of nations 
through the flags and their colors and symbols. God is aware of that. I guess Christians should be as well. Amen? So you compare the colors of the four horsemen to these other flags, and they, they just don't match. Let's go to other countries. What's the first flag on the left? America doesn't match. Second one? No way, I heard, good. Third one? Russia. To Americans, the evil empire. But they are passing more Christian laws than America is right now. Putin is the one that, that's criticizing the West, saying that the West has now become so, quote-unquote, egalitarian that faith in God and faith in Satan is equal. He says that's the path to degradation. Yeah, Vladimir Putin. He's not my hero. He's not my president. But I tell you what, that makes a lot of sense. You equate belief in God the God that gave us the Judeo-Christian value, philosophy, and religion that built the best civilizations in the world, you equate that with belief in idols or Lucifer himself? Something's going to go wrong. Amen? But look at this. All the countries that will be leading World War III all share the same four colors on their flags. God is not trying to confuse us. He has spoken very simply, succinctly, clearly. Don't think the book of Revelation is so hard. Amen? So those are the uh, first four seals. Let's continue with the fourth seal. Revelation 6 verse 8 continues and says, And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death. Please read it carefully. It does not say that a quarter of humans will die. Again, a lot of prophecy teachers, they just make a leap in interpretation, and the congregation maybe is just, you know, listening very carelessly. You read it, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, and suddenly everybody, you know, thinks that that means a fourth of the earth will die. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. All it says is power was given to them, the enemies, over a fourth of the earth. And things that they will do will be to kill with sword. Again, sword keeps coming up, doesn't it? Knives keep coming up, basically. Not guns. Not guns. In fact, I mean, if you read Revelation, you want not gun control laws. You want knife control laws. But we can't do that, can we? So, <clears throat> this is called hyperbole. A lot of preachers do this. They exaggerate what is written. They, they catch a word and then they just make leaps and bounds in interpretation. Try not to do that. Because if you do that with this verse, it would mean 1.75 billion people dead by the fourth seal. No, that is not going to happen. That's an exaggeration. All right? Realize that a lot of the events in the book uh, of Revelation and in the Bible, they're just going to happen and almost go unaware, unnoticed by people. It happened at the first coming, didn't it? And the believers thought what? If the Messiah comes, he's got to be powerful. He's got to be tough. He's got to have like two knives, right? And he's going to lead us in a great uh, war, in a victory over our enemies, the Gentiles and the Romans. And that is precisely why the Pharisees missed the Messiah. Because people were looking for something so spectacular. I'm telling you what, it's not Hollywood. I don't think there's ever going to be a 200-meter tsunami that engulfs the Statue of Liberty. I don't see it in the Bible. Even in the worst of times on this planet, the mercy of God is still here. God is still protecting as many people as he can, as many, as people, uh, as many people who dare to believe him. He's going to try. And so none of this stuff that, that's in Hollywood, I think, is going to happen quite that way. But it will still be bad enough and it will be clear enough if you're paying attention that the word of God is being fulfilled. 
All right? So don't look for something that is so hyperbolic, please. Uh, the fact is, a quarter of the human population is currently under Islamic control. Fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9. Let's read together. One, two, three. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. So in the fifth seal, what we're going to see is martyrdom. It continues and says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's a good question. Many saints have asked that. How long, how long? You ever ask that when you pray? How long, how long? Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. I like that. Just a little bit more. Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Let's harmonize that with a couple of other scriptures. Uh, there is martyrdom. What kind of martyrdom? Well, check it out. When they get to heaven, look at what had happened to them. Revelation 20 verse 4 goes back in time and tells you what happened. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. So don't take the mark, whatever the mark is. Don't take the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So a characteristic of the end time is cruel decapitation. I wonder if this is happening. I wonder if this is being fulfilled. I'm going to give you one more scripture that I've not heard quoted before, but I believe that God gives typology. He gives foreshadowing of what happens. He, he gives you something that happened before the thing, the real thing that happens. Amen? It's a metaphor and then the real thing. A metaphor and then the real thing. You killed the lamb and then they crucified Jesus. Make sense? Well, check this out. In Luke chapter 9, verse 9, Herod, representing the world, the power of the world, Herod said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. John was the forerunner of Jesus in his first coming. John does what Elijah will do at Jesus' second coming. John ushers Jesus' first coming just like Elijah will usher Jesus' second coming. So what happened to John? What happened to the forerunner before the appearance of the Messiah? Just before the first revelation of Christ, the forerunner was beheaded. Could this be the same just before the second coming? Now here, hot off the press, you know the prophet Rick Joyner? I regard him highly as a prophet, and uh, he's issued a warning. A few days ago, the Lord gave him a vision. On the 18th of September, 2014, he said in this vision that he saw the gate of hell has been opened. And what he meant by that is ISIS is coming to America. ISIS is coming to America. He saw demonized gangs. He saw killing, he says, that is so bad that it makes the beheading look good. If you want to watch the video, you go to MorningstarTV.com. They will come through the southern border and torture people in such cruel ways, it's never even been seen before. And he said it's going to start from the south. And when it does, and when the beheadings happen, the people will revolt. They will say, where was our government? They will issue martial law. But it won't work, and then there will be anarchy. People will be rising up. You think this is possible? And he said it will start from the south. So let's now take a look at what's been happening in the past few weeks. Starting on the 19th of August, 2014, James Foley was beheaded on YouTube. That was an unprecedented event, wasn't it? The whole world saw what the Bible has declared to be the fifth seal. 
Now, somebody asked me when I preached this, I said, but these people aren't Christian. I know. But do you know how many millions of Christians get killed and the secular media will not care? I mean, how many thousands of Christians just in Syria alone have been killed and tortured? So what we're going to see on TV is not necessarily the persecution of Christians that we are, you know, reading about in the Bible because they don't care about us. But when one of their own reporter gets beheaded, one reporter for probably thousands and tens of thousands of Christians, it will become news. It still fulfills the Bible. And look, whether it's Christian or non-Christian, it's a human being. It's a person that God made, and He loves them, and He cares about them. Amen? So I think very much we're, we're talking about the opening of the fifth seal right in front of our eyes, that it just happen. Now, am I dogmatic about it? No. No, if we get further information, if we get further, you know, uh, news, I might have to update because this is the, you know, uh, I guess the privilege of being a flawed human being. We teach in part, we see in part, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Right? Only when Jesus has come, then you're not going to need a teacher like me. But for now, to the best of my uh, ability to feed you as the people of God, I think it seems to be fitting quite congruently, quite well. Then you had on the 2nd of September the beheading of Stephen Sotloff, another American uh, who happened to be Jewish as well. 13th of September, you had the beheading of the uh, British aid worker, David Haynes. Then this one kind of escaped the news in Australia. But did you know that an 82-year-old grandmother in the UK got beheaded in her own garden? It's not a gardening accident. And if you read it, you'll find out, but you have to dig a little bit. It was a Muslim convert who beheaded this grandmother in her garden. But they're not even publicizing this. Then on the 24th of September, Hervé Gourdel, which uh, uh, he was a French mountaineer, was beheaded in Algeria. And look at the age of these people. Huh? I mean, uh, previously they were just in their 30s and 40s. Hervé Gourdel is, in, uh, is 55. And then today, today, a 54-year-old woman, Colleen Hufford, was beheaded in Oklahoma, USA. Do you think it was by a Christian? People say, well, faith doesn't matter. You know, this has nothing to do with faith. Well, faith governs action. Belief governs behavior. If you believe it's good to go to work, I'm going to see you hardworking. That will be your behavior. Is that right? Belief governs behavior. Otherwise, why would we have beliefs? So it's absurd to say that this has nothing to do with faith. It has everything to do with faith. Well, it's poverty. Well, Christians live in poverty. You don't see them going around beheading people. They will blame things. They will deceive you with many strong delusions. And unfortunately, it's an age where the Bible predicts that many will happily receive the deception when the facts are very clear. Has it arrived, like Rick Joyner saw only a few days ago, has it arrived in America? Seems like it. Seems like it started today. And today, may, biblically speaking, may be the first day of Rosh Hashanah or the year 5775. Everything is in the timing of God. You can't look at your calendar. You can't look at the Western calendar. You look at the Hebrew calendar, God's calendar, and things begin to make sense. People say, oh, Pastor Steve, well, this has got nothing to do with me. Well, for those of you who live in Australia, it's already come. This ISIS jihadist, sympathizer, Newman, hater, hater, not hater, but hater, stabbed two police officers in Endeavor Hills. We got church members from Endeavor Hills. 
We drive through Endeavor Hills. We're not talking about somewhere far away. This is next door. And this ISIS guy, he was called in for questioning because he was waving the ISIS flag at Fountain Gate. So the police said, will you come in and, you know, let's have a chat. So he comes in and he won't talk to them inside where the, you know, the security camera and everybody's at. He says, I'll meet you outside. So he went outside and the police officer extended his hand to say hello. And then he just stabbed him and stabbed two of them. Well, thank God in Australia, we must have a lot of grace because no one's died. So far, we've caught terrorists before the plot. And we got this guy um, was shot. He's not dead. They're going to interview him afterwards. You know, and you think about it yourself. If, if this starts happening next door to you, you're having like lunch in Dandenong or something, and somebody takes a knife and starts cutting somebody's head off, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What you got on you? Right? So I don't know. I don't know how it's going to play out here. It looks like we're very, very um, well protected. Australia seems to have a lot of grace, but I would not be complacent. Rick Joyner said that if we fast and pray, if we seek God's face, if we intercede, maybe some of these things can be averted in our time. Maybe, you know, it can happen after we're gone, during the tribulation. We don't want this stuff to happen, but I won't, I won't be complacent about it. It's time to get serious with our faith, amen?